you are live. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a stormy, clouded sky here in the low felt of South Africa. That's the northeastern corner of the southernmost country on the African continent. And you are on a live safari here from the iconic Kruger National Park. My name is James Henry. On camera today, we have got Viam. Hello, Viam. Very nice sandals you're wearing today. And in the final control, we have Nicola. She is being ably assisted by Louise. And on the other vehicle, of course, the very manly Scott Dyson and the equally manly Brian Joubert. They will be traveling to Arethusa. Now, if you are joining us for the first time, you are most welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you for giving us of your time. And if I might ask you to contribute to our little journey through the wilderness this afternoon, by talking to us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live, or questions at wildearth.tv if you prefer to use the email. Otherwise, if you're watching on YouTube, there is the YouTube chat function, which is a, uh, well, I just don't know how it works. I'm sure you can figure it out, though. Uh, our plan this more afternoon is to head towards a watering hole down here, called Treehouse Watering Hole. Uh, there were some tracks of two wild dogs yesterday, and they came into the reserve. Uh, we actually saw them yesterday, popping, a, sort of running around. They seem to be from a dispersal group, which means from a group or a pack of dogs that has got to the age where the youngsters have to move off and go and form their own packs. And this is, this is two males. They're separate in separate sex groups. And this seems to be two males, dispersal males. I hope I don't fall out the car. And that's basically what they're doing, and hopefully we'll be able to find them. Then we will head towards Bivelshook Dam later on in the evening, hopefully to find the Nkohuma Pride. They have been, we think, on a kill somewhere to the east of the dam, west of the dam, sorry. A uh, very thick block. We were unable to find them this morning, so that's the general idea for the afternoon. Things out here in the wilderness seldom go the way we plan them, simply because it is so big and so vast, and there are no fences around this area where we work, and so we just don't know what's going to happen around the next corner. And Michelle, a very nice question, and you're absolutely correct. You're saying that uh, you're from New Jersey, by the way, which is marvelous to know. Thank you for watching all the way from New Jersey. You say it's bizarre that there are no animals at the Juma Dam pan. And I agree, it is slightly bizarre, especially after the plethora of buffalo, hippo, elephant, nyala, impala, wildebeest that we've had there lately. And the reason for that, Michelle, I think is, as you say, water is now dispersed. After the rain we had, there are puddles all over the place. The natural pans are full of water. And so those buffalo have gone off to find some solace there. I suspect maybe the rivers have started flowing further to the south, and that's where the hippos have gone. Maybe they've gone to the larger bodies of water somewhere around the place. Anyway, that's why there isn't anything there at the moment. I don't know how much more rain we're going to have this season. I don't think it's going to take us anywhere near the average that we should should get. So I think it's still going to get very dry, and I think that that pan activity will return. There is, though, a sort of grayish stormy cloud seemingly coming towards us. So maybe we'll have a spattering of rain or two, but there's certainly nothing predicted for at this stage. And that is the general idea. I'm going to sit down now before I fall out of the car. And let's head across to Scott Dyson, get his plans for the afternoon. I'll see you at the water. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott, and I'm teamed up with Brian Joubert, AKA The Thumb, on camera with me. We have also got, also got Kirsty McLennan-Smith here on the back for security reasons. She's usually in the director's chair, but with this gloomy gray cloud ahead of us, I felt we needed backup. And as we headed out, I said to Brian and Kirsty, I can taste rain. And we couldn't see this cloud at that stage, but there's something about, I don't know what it is, the weather that's making me feel we may get lucky and may get a little bit of moisture. And it's quite hot, despite that big gray cloud ahead of us, it's 31 degrees Celsius, which is about 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm hoping the temperature is going to drop drastically now that this cloud is slowly enveloping the sun, as that will make the animals more comfortable and more likely to become active and playful. 
So, I know James has told you his plans. I am initially going to head across to Arethusa just to get an update from the guys over the radio as to what happened there this morning, as well as to try and establish if there's anything worth following up on, of course. Ah. We've got an impala trapped in this fallen down marula tree. What is it going to do? Is it going to try and hop over that, or is it just going to enjoy nibbling on that long blade of grass that's just plucked? Pops. It escaped. A young male. It would have been born just over a year ago, and it's been phenomenal to see how quickly they have grown and over the year that I've been here, as well as the next generation that got born in November last year. Anyway, enough about the Impala. We're going to send you over to James, who's at the Treehouse Waterhole. We have arrived at the water, everyone, and uh, there isn't a great sort of a dissension of vast mammals. There is one Impala. We'll see if we can make him stand still. No, he's dipsconding as fast as he can down towards the drainage area. Anyway, bye. Do have a nice afternoon. Thank you for the favor you have granted me. Hmm. Now, hello, Charlotte. You're in Port Elizabeth, of course, very close to Kenton on Sea, where my mother and father are probably about to tuck into some tea as we speak. Um, you want to know, Charlotte, the dams, you say, are full of mud, as opposed to... Sorry, that just was... My attention was arrested by a bird. It was a lilac-breasted roller, and it was chasing a kingfisher. You know, that's what happened there. Charlotte, they are quite muddy. Yes, the dams are muddy, and they will look a lot more muddy uh, after some rain, and then, you know, that obviously is lessened if we have even more rain. This particular dam, though, is not nearly as muddy, for example, as Biffle's Hook. And that's just got to do with the makeup of the clay here. You can see here that this clay is not that sort of... It doesn't make those sort of hexagonal shapes with very sharp edges that retains the water for a very long time. This is kind of soft, standard-issue yeah. clay, if you like. Excuse me one second. Scott is hailing me on the radio. Go ahead. I will get back to you. James, just to let you know my you hear him speaking. I have taken power lines uh, onto the power plans and then east of the power So that's the Scots plan. West of the so we know what road has been followed, and so we can not check the same thing. Oh, thanks. Now, what happens in a place like Bivolzook Dam is that there's a lot more probably mineral within the clay. Now, I don't know if you remember your chemistry from school. I suppose I could draw it for you in the sand if you'd like me to, but I'm going to, you'll have to tell me if you want me to do this. The minerals go into what we call solution, and they form ions. Hey. Okay. Oh, sorry. The um is uh, pointed the camera at me. That's a rather awkward moment there. Um, and they form ions, and they go into solution, and when the water disappears from the clay, it starts to stick together because those ions come back together and they form the chemical minerals. And so they suck the clay back together. Then when the water goes back into the, water, the, the clay, those minerals are, go into solution again and the ions repel each other, but, but like the opposite poles of a magnet might, and then the clay kind of dissipates. But as soon as it dries, it forms that very hard and very sharp-edged hexagonal shapes we saw in Bivolzog Dam. This is just means that this is a different kind of clay. There's also underneath here a natural spring. What are you looking at, Jim? Are you just panning artistically? Mm. Very nice. Are you looking at something? There's a bird there. Oh, there is. I can't see it, though. But for on the camera, let me try and identify this little bird. Ah, it is a chagra. I was trying to see if it'll move. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, I'm talking rubbish. That's a female red-backed trike. That's a really nice bird to see. Totally distinct from the male, but you, do, you can see from that kind of blackish eye and the freckles on the breast, 
and obviously the red wings. And the male, of course, has got that um, bandit's mask around his eyes. The female red-backed shrike. Well done, Viam. Nice spotting there. Good job. On we go. Not much going on here. Oh, brilliant. So, Connie, you are a Pete's, avid Pete's Pond watcher, and you say you notice always, Connie, when there is rain there, the activity at the pond decreases markedly. So that's very interesting. Thank you for that. And I'm sure it's simply because there's water dispersed. And animals, you know, they're quite private creatures, and so they often won't want to be around each other if they can avoid it. And especially those old buffalo bulls. We found a buffalo bull yesterday in a tiny little pan, just seemingly seeking out some privacy. Thank you, Vim Foot and Rock and Rolly. You uh, approved thoroughly of my side saddle beginning this, morning, this afternoon. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was just saying to Vim, I, I quite like it because it means I get to eye level with you, which is, uh, I think, a bit better than me staring up out of the vast and deep cockpit of this Land Rover. Not so vast and deep if you're the size of Brent Leo Smith, of course, but for me, quite large. He says it's too small, yes. Yes. All right, we're going to carry on along this road. Let's go across to Scott. He's at Arethusa. So we are nearly at Arethusa. It's about 100 meters to our west. We are driving parallel to the boundary road. And we'll shortly be across there. No, we won't shortly be across there because we've got some kind of a traffic jam ahead of us. And I'm hoping that these buffalo have just arrived at what is a little mud wallow in the road here. Hello to Kudu, who's just mentioned that it's the last drive that they'll be able to watch for the next week because they have to be away on work and they would like to see some elephants. And we will do our best to try and get you into position with either a big bull or a breeding herd, or both if we're lucky. But there haven't been that many elephants around recently. I oh, settled down, Oxpeckers. Oh, shame. They're fighting over a gaping wound on that buffalo's back, which has now obviously been completely covered by... <laughs> The other massive individual that walked in front of the frame. There we can see though now, Brian. And we can recognize this bull. I'm sure a lot of you will recognize that wound. It's been there gaping for quite some time. Oh. And as much good as oxpeckers can do for the animals gleaning off the parasites, in a scenario like this, they tend to keep the wound open. I guess they are keeping it clean to a degree, but it just doesn't seem to be healing. Buffalo doesn't seem too perturbed, though, and it's probably because it's really enjoying the cool, satisfying, muddy liquid that it's lying in. And I know you were just discussing that with James, how some of the animals can get stuck, as you saw there. There was no risk of that happening. Oh, straight into the next wallow. Oh, we could see that wound now a little bit better. The angles certainly providing us with a better insight into exactly what it's looking like. Ooh. Hello, Donna. You've noticed. Ah, oh, time to get some makeup on. I love it the way the horned animals do this. Kudu and Yala will also do similar things. Sorry, Donna and Jackson, you're saying that you're loving this blush of green. That's taken over the bush vault since the last rains we had a couple of nights ago and you're right it's fascinating how quickly the vegetation responded to the little bit of moisture that we received and it's a very pleasant change of scenery i was watching a clip 
uh, that Romeo, one of the old cameramen, sent me. It was of his last drive, which was, oof, when was it? Uh, I can't even remember when that would have been, but it was summer, the last summer, and we were driving through the Mulwati riverbed, and it's just scary to see how much less grass there is than last season. It looks nothing like a regular summer. Let me try and reposition. Wayne, yes, it's hard to believe how this buffalo doesn't find these oxpeckers digging through that wound more painful. I cannot give you a good description other than the fact that I guess it's a very tough beast. And maybe that wound has almost become numb. Hello, Tour Pro. And you have just said that buffaloes are one of your favorite animals because you love the expression on their faces. And I agree, they really can cast a pose. And there's something about their faces that, oh, oh here we go. We got really spoiled the other day with the buffalo doing its thing in a mud wall and it looks like we're about to get the same kind of a show. Come on, go all the way over. You can do it. <laughs> yes, no. Look at how big they are. They are ginormous. Look at that big muscle on its neck. Even though they move quite slowly and almost lethargically, if they need to, they can really turn on their speed, and they are incredibly powerful. They will crash through all manner of vegetation when need be, either when chasing lions or being chased by them. So don't be fooled by their somewhat docile appearance. Oh, the oxpeck is already back. These are the red-billed oxpeckers. There are two different types that you get. One is called the yellow build that have got a portion of their beak in the front that is yellow and the back half red. A little bit bigger than these. Those are the two ox pickers that you get. Roly, you've just said that the buffalo doesn't appear to be enjoying these ox pickers. You're right. I'm sure it isn't, but their persistence will cause him to, I guess, give up. I mean, there's a limit to how much he can keep trying to chase them off or wriggle his body. So I think he's almost, like I said, just learned to deal with them. That wound has been there for quite some time. You can see that big old boy there has got the mud caking on his body and beginning to dry. And that'll have a great effect on the parasites, it may actually pluck them off as the mud dries. It's incredible when that mud does dry on your skin. It almost pulls, well, it does. It pulls incredibly tight on all your leg hairs. And then, obviously, creates a nice solid casing to prevent new parasites jumping on board. And then when they do rub off that hard casing, it will hopefully peel off the parasites that are encased within it. Hello, Sunil. Sorry, I should have explained a little bit better, but I guess your question will help me do that. You would like to know if they are really cleaning the wood, or is it simply that they like the taste of blood? Uh, it's the latter first. They like the taste of blood. That is what they feed on. And what they'll do is they will actually target blood in the form of ticks, usually. That's the main parasite that they are looking for, blood-sucking ticks. But if they can access the blood directly, there's nothing wrong with that, so that's what they're doing here. Indirectly, they are keeping it clean, but that's not what they are. That's not their intention. Their intentions are merely to feed themselves. 
but I guess that cleaning process, like I said, does keep the wound open and it'll make it difficult to heal because I'll just keep reopening the scabs. Hmm. Mike in Florida, you'd like to know if that wound will now remain open for the rest of the buffalo's life. And it could. I mean, it, it's been there for quite some time. I, I, recognize, I recognize this buffalo and that wound, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Now, reasons for that could be simply the fact that the buffalo is not as well nourished as it ordinarily would be this summer, so the summer bounty is not here. And during what would normally be a summer bounty, when the animals get really good condition, maybe it would have healed. But because of the drought, together with the ox pickers, maybe that's causing it to not heal. Hard to be completely certain. Oh, looks like he's getting ready for another wallow. Wallow dance. So yeah, Mike, it'll be interesting to see. I've got a feeling that that is never going to heal. It's very deep and it has been there for quite some time. Imagine not being able to scratch yourself like we do with our hands and arms that can reach just about anywhere on our body. They do not have that luxury. So next time you're itchy, try and pretend you're a four-legged animal and see, see what you find to scratch yourself up on. <laughs> Interesting little thought has just come through from Big Dave, also in Florida, where Mike sent the last question from. You said that as humans, we need to exercise to keep healthy and fit and, you know, be ready to sprint if we need to. And I guess if we don't, we'll become stiff and sore if we do have to, for some reason, all of a sudden run somewhere. And therefore, when Buffalo do have to turn it on from time to time, will they also get stiff? Um, Big Dave, I think that they are keeping... Whoa! We nearly got some mud on us there. That would have been awesome. Come on, one more. You can reach us. He's probably about six meters away, and the mud literally landed at the side of the car here. Awesome. Um, so I think they are getting trained. I mean, they will get frights from time to time when they need to run. They will come across lion quite often, I think, and even if it's not lying, um, I think the, the fact that they are moving so much more than we are if we are not exercising, you know, they're doing a lot of walking around every single day, that they are essentially keeping fitter than an average human would. So I think that they are kind of always keeping relatively in good shape, especially compared to us humans who may go for many moons without exercising or even walking long distances. But I like the way you, you're thinking there. It would be interesting to know if, you know, a, a sustained period of exertion will cause them to need to have a longer sleep the next day. And I think certainly it's a possibility. Splay their hooves when they <laughs> when they kind of leave the ground and start going up into the air. They they open up as if you were opening up your hand. Let's oh <laughs> try and stretch out as far as possible. Oh, nothing like licking some muddy water off your lips. <laughs> Going back for that underthroat scratch again. And will that be enough? Are you feeling a little bit lonely? It looks like the other members of the small bachelor herd have slowly moved off. I think he's going to possibly follow suit. Mike in Florida. I was waiting for somebody to admit that they have done some funny scratchings. 
Um, I do the same thing, Mike. Mike's admitted to scratching his back on a tree. There's nothing better than, you know, getting to that center part of your back that's difficult to reach with your hands. Sometimes I'll also use a corner of a wall. That can also be good if there's no trees nearby. Very good. We're going to leave this buffalo to its own devices here. He's just leaving the, the wallow right now, so good timing. He's finished his show. Thank you, boy. And we shall be sending you back across to James to see how he's getting along. There is a squirrel alarm calling and a bird alarm calling further to the north. Let's just go a little bit closer. The squirrel has now stopped. Beastly little rodent. It's in this tree here. There, you can hear it. It has ceased. Let's continue. They have got very, very good eyes, the squirrels. They're able to see a long way, and sometimes they'll alarm call and you won't have any idea what they're looking at, and then, you know, sort of 150 meters down the road, you'll find what it was. So the squirrels alarm calling there, and I just heard some birds alarming up here. So let's have a quick look. And if... Ah... Uh, there. They're alarm calling at a raptor, a bird. Sounds like a Wahlberg's eagle. You can hear it calling there. That's what it was. So for those of you who are new viewers and you don't know what the term alarm calling means, well, I mean, it means exactly what it sounds like. When animals see something or birds see something that makes them afraid, a predator, they will alarm call. And I think it's, uh, they learn to listen to each other's alarm calls as much as they listen to their own. There, there it is, there it is. I can see where it is now. I think it's just flown off. It looked like two of them together. No, it's flown off now. I'm pretty sure a Wahlberg's eagle, everyone. Anyway. So it goes. That's what the squirrel was shouting at. And that's a very valid alarm call, of course, because a Wahlberg's eagle will happily eat a squirrel. Hello, Cat and Tampa. We're looking at a bird, and you say you have managed to rack up 67 birds since the start of your bird list, which is at the beginning of the year. Well done. I think that's pretty good going. And for those of you who would like to keep lists, I always think it's great. I think it's lovely to hear what the lists are that you have and how big they become and how quickly they become so large. You can see the sun about to go down behind that storm cloud, which I don't believe is going to give us any rain at all. Sorry, Darlene, a very nice question in New Hampshire. It sounds like it's about interspecific playing, play behavior. Um, which two species, Nikki? Social behavior between which? The wolf and the raven. That is interesting. I hadn't heard that. Well, Darlene, you want to know, you say that there is very clear and obvious and well-documented play behavior between wolves and ravens. And have we noticed anything out here where different species will play with each other? Ooh. I mean, there's certainly a relationship that mongoose have with hornbills, but that's more of a practical arrangement. I don't know that they would ever play with each other. Um, 
I suppose some animals of similar size might play with each other. I've definitely seen sort of mixed herds of herbivores, especially with the youngsters sort of chasing each other around, but you never know if that's serious or not. And there, as Nikki is saying, we had zebra and impala the other day. But the zebra were sort of keeping to themselves, and maybe they would chase the impala once or twice, and that was, the impala would run away. It wasn't like there was kind of mutual playing. It's a really interesting one. I'm going to look out for it. Thank you, Darlene. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for that. I certainly haven't noticed it with any of the predators. They tend to dislike each other with a vehement intensity. Right, we're going to leave this particular area fairly soon. Mm. And Andre, you've been on a walk in the Kruger around Crocodile Bridge, which is the southern section of the Kruger, and you say you've been on a walk there, and you saw on foot an elephant sleeping on the ground. You want to know if I've ever seen it? Is it common? And your ranger who took you on that walk said that he had never seen it before. Um, Andre, it does happen. The little ones often sleep on the ground. There's a warthog here. It's only about four kilometers off the road. You see it there? Mm, a little bit of it. It's just quite a big ball. He's moved. Has he moved? Exactly. Oh, there he is. There we go. Warthog, everyone. Let me just quickly finish Andre's question. So, yes, young elephants will sleep on their sides quite often. They'll often lean up against termite mounds, actually, and then sometimes big bulls will also sleep on their sides, but they won't sleep for long like that. Their organs are very heavy, and they will crush, basically, all the organs underneath them will be crushed eventually and sort of put out of shape if an elephant was to lie on its side for too long. So yes, they will sometimes lie down, not often for very long, and much more so the youngsters than the adults. The rest of them are able to sleep standing up. Right, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty average. More talk sighting, really. Press on. Nice big ball. As I was saying today, 100 kilograms they get to, and somebody said, could you liken it to a dog? Um, you know, size-wise, and I said, well, like a big bull terrier. And, but a bull terrier doesn't get anywhere near the mass of 100 kilograms. So they must be incredibly dense animals. Oh, a little baby buffalo with Scott. Isn't this a surprise? Um, it's very, very uncommon to see a lady buffalo with just her two offspring. And there might be a couple of other ladies here, but they may have been, I'm guessing, fragmented from their herd during a lion hunt when they would have all split off in different directions. Or who knows, maybe it's merely the drought that's causing them to act differently, branch away from the large herd. You can tell that it's a lady, obviously, because she's got two youngsters right next to her, and also because where her horns meet in the center of her head, which we'll see when she faces us again, there's not a large crown of horn. So there's the main difference. Now, the risk that she faces being away from the herd is that if she were to come across lions, she'd have very little help. In terms of defense, buffalo have got the incredible ability to be able to muster up their willpower and turn around after lions have spooked them, possibly brought down a member of the herd, and then they can rally up and chase the lions off them, often rescuing members who are in the claws of the lions. Oh, there's one male in the mud wallow next to them, so he would help. Hello, Kathy, in New York, and thank you for your kind words. You are enjoying the Safari Live experience, and it is such a wonderful experience that we are all so lucky to be a part of. You're wondering how old buffaloes will live to on average, and 
anywhere between 20 years and 25 years would be a really good innings for a Cape Buffalo. Giraffe have a similar lifespan and in general, the larger the herbivore, the longer they live for. Dikers, much smaller, the smallest of the antelope we get here, will live for, well, I think, around eight years, I'm told, eight to ten years, so they don't live for as long. Looks like all three of them are chewing the cud. <laughs> and you can see that youngster, Brian is at full zoom, so he sadly can't take any closer, but there's a funny little kind of birthmark almost on that smallest calf's nose. Great, well, we just thought we'd give you that surprising little update. We are now on Arethusa, and we are driving along the same road where we had Tingana just a couple of days back. We saw him a little bit further behind us. So I'm not expecting to find him. I just thought I'd let you know out of interest where we are. So Andre, you were chatting with James about elephants and their sleeping behavior. And there's a funny story about elephants and sleeping. It was <laughs> one of basically the property to the north of us, Andre, is called Buffalo's Hook. And South, South African people uh, it's, it's, it can buy into kind of timeshare there. So they can buy a week or a couple of weeks uh, to come and stay at the, the various camps on that property. And the beauty of buying your timeshare at those camps is that you come in and you've got your own vehicle that you drive around and your own camp. You don't have a guide necessarily and you've got a lot of freedom in this incredible wilderness area. So it's an attractive opportunity to a lot of South Africans that enjoy the bush. You find a lot of these guys are wealthy bankers that have got the money to be able to buy into this and not necessarily the knowledge of the bush. And that provides us with some funny moments like the one I'm about to tell you. <laughs> this guy called in over the radio that he had located the file in the pronouncing the Shangan terribly, um, which is the first thing that, the mistake that all of them make that we can giggle at. And we were all quite surprised because it was right on the center of Juma and the fact that he was able to find this dead elephant before any of the guides have was interesting. So the one guide asked, you know, copy that, thank you for the updates. Um, is it smelly, you know, is it, do you think it's been dead for long? And the person replied, no, no, it, it seems very, very fresh. There's no vultures here, doesn't smell. And <laughs> That's when all of us listening in on this conversation started thinking, and we wonder if this guy knows what he's talking about. So the guide in question, who asked him initially if it was smelly, then asked, um, do you know that elephants can sleep lying down? To which the landowner replied, negative. And then it was very quiet, because obviously he then took a closer look and realized that it was just an elephant having a snooze. So he felt quite embarrassed about that whole situation and we all chuckled amongst ourselves. So that's the story of the sleeping dead elephant. James has got an electric turquoise bird he would like to show you. It doesn't look very electric turquoise from there. Of course, it's plain white on the belly. But the reason we stopped, and this is a very common bird that you've all seen a hundred times before. It is a woodland kingfisher. But he was doing a remarkable display with another bird just to the right-hand side. And that's, we're just going to zoom in here and sit here for two minutes and see if he won't do the incredible display they do. What they do is they hold their wings out. They make a chirring noise and then they jump around. They do these 180-degree de pirouettes on the branch. And again, I mean, it looks like a completely simple operation. But can you imagine standing on top of a wall with your standard-issue balance and jumping up 
turning around 180 degrees and then landing with your arms out completely balanced, it would be almost impossible. The other one is still there. I think they're probably a little bit disturbed by us. But we had a question earlier today about just while we wait for them to see if they decide to do anything. We had a question earlier today about the woodland kingfisher and the mangrove kingfisher, and that I think was from Siberia Zumi, and wanted to know about what the difference is. And I said to you that the mangrove kingfisher does not have a black underside to the bill. And it's quite nice, you can see on that kingfisher that he does have a black underside to the bill. You see that, Ben? Mm -mm. You can't see that, can you? I'll show you a picture if you don't believe me, Vian. There, now you can see it. There, you can see it there. And now you've got the electric, yes, the electric turquoise or halcyon blue. And if they start cheering again, we'll whip across to them. There's the mangrove kingfisher. It looks almost identical, it just looks a bit more grubby. And you can see there, no black underbill. And there's the black underbill. And of course, the mangrove kingfisher called mangrove because he lives in the mangroves and therefore unlikely to be found in a bush filled area like this. That said, there are records of them away from mangrove forests. Okay. Thank you very much, Kingfisher, for doing your display just for us and not for anyone else. Highly, highly selfish of you. Come on. Do it. Get on with it. They are magnificent looking birds, you know. I mean, I know there are thousands of them around at the moment, but they're fantastic looking creatures. Of course, very closely related. <laughs> How cool is that? I think the other one has flown off. Yes, it has. That was marvellous. Good. Hooray. I'm glad he did that. That was really nice. <laughs> there he goes. A little F-16. That was great. Now, Vernie, you want to know if uh, Wahlberg's eagles are ma migratory birds, and then the second part of your question came through, and what are the migratory birds? I thought it was going to be, but thankfully it's only the migratory eagles, because I think for me to name all migratory birds would get me horribly tongue-tied. That'd probably drive into a by mistake. The Wahlbergs is indeed a migratory eagle species. They're one of the first to come back after their migration. They normally arrive sort of at the end of August, middle to end of August, sometimes even before that. Uh, but I think that would sort of indicate a very poor season. There's a Stienbock that was hiding behind a bush. Now, there's something very interesting about the Stienbock. I want you to look at the hips sticking out there, and I find this very interesting. So, Vernie, yes, the Wahlbergs is migratory. It goes up into sort of central equatorial Africa for our winter and then comes back during our summertime. The other... All the other brown eagles, except the tawny, are migratory. So the step, the lesser spotted, the booted, they are all migratory birds and will leave here for the winter time. So that Stenbock is what we call a concentrate feeder. And it means that it will be affected by the drought more than a bulk grazer, like a buffalo, for example, or a wildebeest or a zebra. It needs very concentrated, high-energy food. You can see his little ribs sticking out there. It's a bit sad. So they need to eat the sort of rich underground parts of grasses. They'll probably eat some flowers. Um, what else? They may even eat fruits if they are around because they have a hugely high energy need per kilogram of Stienbock. And them and the diker and the other small animals, the small antelope, the small herbivores will really be struggling now to keep up with things 
with the nutritional state of the rangeland like it is. Yes, I'm sure the rain would have helped, but even straight green grass for an animal like that is not sufficient. They need to eat really kind of concentrated stuff, very specific grass species. You can see the drought taking its toll on that steenbok. It's quite sad to see his little lip sticking out. Didn't like that at all. Now, Jack, you're in Romania, and I think it's just wonderful that we're hearing from Romania. Thank you very much for getting hold of us. And you want to know what kind of felt we have here. Now, that's quite an in-depth question for somebody all the way from Romania. Well done. And you're asking, you say that you read that there are four types of felt in the Kruger. Now, felt, for those of you who don't know, is an Afrikaans word that basically means what? The land. I suppose, field, That's literally field. But it, I suppose the, the correct English term would be rangeland. So land on which trees and grass grow and animals will s survive off it. So you say there are four types of rangeland. It really depends, Jack, on how you define it. You, you can get down to much smaller units where there are a great deal more than four. Um, in this particular area, in the Sabi Sands, we have two main types. The main type is this that we can see here. This is called broadleaf cumbretum woodland. That's the main type. It grows on the granite soils and then to the south of the Sabi Sands, growing on gabbro-derived soils, which is a different kind of rock, which therefore makes a different kind of soil. We've got what we call acacia, nigrescence or knobthorn, and red grass savannas. So they are a bit more open, longer grasses, different species. You won't find, the most indicative thing that you won't find are these cabritum trees, and you won't find big marula trees growing on top of the ridge crests. You'll find largely just knobthorn trees. So those are the main kinds that we get here. And then if you want to break it down further, you can. I mean, you can say that towards the Big river banks, we have what we call sodic areas, which again have a different suite of grass and tree species. And then you could even, I mean, you could go down to the level of saying that termitaria or big termite mounds create a separate vegetation type all on their own. So yeah, different kinds and all over the place. I suppose the other obvious one that would be in your definition or the full definition would be Mapani felt, which is a, or Mapani woodland which is a kind of almost mono-specific woodland that occurs up north of where we are here. And I guess you probably have the basalt plains leading into the Lobombos, rhyolite plains, which have a whole different suite of vegetation there. So I would think those would probably be the ones that you get around the Kruger in the main. But in the Sabi Sands, those main two, the broadleafed red bush willow woodland and the acacia nigrescence red grass savanna. Thank you, Jack. Nice to hear from you all the way from Romania. <laughs> a little while back, we found a cinnamon-breasted bunting. And Gracie, you termed this bird, and I think it's the most wonderful name for a bird. You say, you call it the cinnamon, cinnamon bun bird and it makes me want to have cinnamon buns and tea every time you say it. Well, Gracie, you want to know why they are not around and where are they and have they gone away? Gracie, they will be around. I think you'll find that they are sort of semi-nomadic, and what that means is that they're not always in the same place, but they're not migratory, so they don't go to another place to find uh, for the summer or another place for the winter. But like you say, you're actually quite correct. You say that they are nomadic, or you say, will they follow the rain? That's what nomadic means. They will follow areas where there's better food, and they'll go over there. Nice question. Thank you, Gracie. It's a very clever question. Uh, now, what I am looking for quite avidly in the trees here is a mistletoe plant. Not because I wish to hang it over anyone's head. Uh, well, let me get back to that story. Scott's got something interesting to show you. 
So, we have a bit of a bird party here. The bird you can see there is a common scimitable. The one above it chattering excitedly is a red-backed shrike. And I'm guessing there may be a snake in this tree. There's just too much chatter and commotion. Oh, wow, there's a there's a brew-brew in the middle. The one in the middle is called a brew-brew. That's a, a bird we see very rarely. It's got a little bit of brown on it. What are you guys looking at? There's a Franklin feeding on the ground below, so I don't think that's where the danger is. I'm using my binoculars to try and scan into a portion of this vegetation that they kind of seem to be looking into below them to the left, but no joy. That's the brew brew there in the center of the shot, the little bit of brown on its wings. Oh no, maybe I'm getting confused. I'm not watching the monitor in, in the hope that by using my binoculars I'm going to be able to find whatever's in this tree that's alarming them. But I'm not having much joy. Well, the one with the kind of rusty coloration on it. Ooh, oh, that's a female red-headed weaver. That's just arrived, the one with the yellow orangey head. I'll show you, I'll show you these all in the book once we're done. I'm gonna just top out quickly and go and have a look under this tree and see if, by being a little bit closer, I can't see what's going on. Okay. Obviously, just because I assume that there's a snake in the tree, it doesn't mean there's not another predator nearby. It was birds that led us to a big male leopard the other day, so... This ma oh. oh, it's about to fly, Brian. It's in the bottom right of the tree. It's a pearl-spotted owl. I don't know if you can see it there. And if you follow... Oh, there it goes. Well done. Well done. I think you got a glimpse mm. of the predator flying away. A tiny, tiny little owlet, which operates during the daytime and often hunts birds. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come around, grab my book, and show you all the different little birds we got to see there. Awesome. Well, that was fun. Always nice to... Blessings, blessings. Okay, so let's start with the owl. I'm sure there are going to be quite a few birds for you guys to add to your lists, possibly, here. So, I'm guessing it was a pearl-spotted owlet. They are more common than this cousin, the African barred owlet, but these two look very similar, um, except that the barred Owlet has got a barred chest, whereas the pearl spotted owlet has got a streaked chest. Vertical streaks as opposed to horizontal bars. Um, I couldn't get a very close look at it, but wasn't that fascinating to hear all those much smaller birds alarming for this individual? They can be quite voracious predators. They're not big at all. They're tiny little critters, about that big. And they can hunt prey the same size as them, and often birds. <laughs> now, where are we going to start? Let's start with the brew brew. 120. What a, what a bizarre name. Just get the volume down there. So there's Mr. Brew Brew. You may have noticed that rusty kind of stripe along its wing. So that was the one. Then the other one was the red backed shrike, which was over here. Tom and Dallas, you were wondering about the spelling of the Brew Brew, so I'm glad you've got that B-R-U-B-R-U. -R -U -B -R -U. There's the Red Back Shrike. Uh, who else have we got to look for? The Scimitable will be here. Racked up some good birds here. It's called the Common Scimitable. It is not very common in this area. Now, it can be confused with its cousin in the area the red-billed wood hoopoe, or now known as the green wood hoopoe, but they are smaller, lack the red bull, but have a very similar body shape. The scimitables are considerably smaller, though. They're about half the size of a 
green wood hoop here. Then the weaver at the end there. 173. It was, I'm 90% certain it was a female red-headed weaver. Some of you may have seen the red-headed weavers before. Um, incredible bird. I'm just going to page over just to show you the other weavers. Yeah, you know, I don't think it was any of the, uh, the other females. It was the first thought that came to mind that it would be a red-headed weaver. So we'll go with that. And that was all the birds, I think, that we got to see in that bush. We're getting lucky. Sometimes you'll have these animals alarm calling but not actually find what it is, and it's hugely frustrating. I think a lot of the time in that, those cases it's snakes that have got such good camouflage. Well, I'm very happy to hear you logged in just in time to get the brew brew on your list. Good news. And you're up to 141 different birds. Marilyn, you also mentioned that you enjoyed that brew brew, an extra one. Very good. For any of you who are feeling left out, it's very simple to create a bird list of your own. You can write it down on a piece of paper, start summing a list of notes on your phone, anything. There's all manner of different ways to start a bird list, and you basically just number, write down the bird. And that way you can challenge yourself to try and get more and more different species. You're up against Mike in Florida, who's got 200 and something. So he is, I think, currently leading the charge. Hello, Zebbies. We've been very fortunate recently. A lot of zebra around. The Sabi Sands is not renowned for good zebra viewing. I've been on many scenarios where I'll be driving around searching frantically on the final morning of my guests three or four nights today, hoping to find a zebra after they've seen all manner of other different high profile sightings. And I think that's because of the, the drought really. We've got short open, even though it's small patches, but it's short open grasslands that they can feed on. Not expansive, but here you can see in between the bushes are Lots of very suitable food for them. Obviously, we'll feel a lot safer as well moving through vegetation like this when it's it's thick. But naturally, a regular winter would mean uh, sorry, a regular summer would mean that all the trees would have lots of leaves, and we probably wouldn't be able to see the zebra from where we are now in an ordinary summer. We definitely wouldn't actually. It would be that much thicker. All the views we're getting now would just be a thick green blanket. Very good. Bye-bye, Zebras. We've got an awesome eagle up here, Brian, top of the tree. This is a martial eagle. It is the ultimate bird of prey of this area. Oh, look, there's, it looks like a little drongo, possibly a starling sitting up to the left of it that we may see giving the martial eagle a hard time. Now, to give you an idea of how big this bird is, its wingspan can reach up to two and a half meters. That is bigger than a door, longer than your average door. It is ginormous. It's also capable of hunting prey as big as baby impala. It usually will take game birds. Monitor lizards are one of their favorites. Thank you. 
Seems like now the hunting isn't its main priority. It looks like it's doing some preening of the old feathers. I've never seen one of these birds hunting in action. I mean, I've never actually seen any birds hunting successfully. It's a pity about their ability to fly. It means that it, they leave us behind. But it would be something incredible to see this animal in action. All right, it'll do. It would be nice if we had a little bit more zoom there, but we don't, so fear not, Brian wasn't teasing you by not taking you closer in. Hello, Rainier in Texas. You would like to know a little bit more about the Woodlands Kingfisher and its display that you saw with James. I'm very happy you got to see that because I know I personally haven't managed to show you them displaying like that this summer. And you'd like to know if they do it every time they, they land and call or is it just a, a certain event that will induce them to do it? And it's, it's not every time. Sometimes they'll be calling without doing that. For me, most often, once they are calling and you hear them excitedly calling, once they do a flight, as soon as they land on a branch, that is when they'll do the display. And I'm not sure if you saw it doing the 180, but they'll land on a branch, immediately hold their wings up, and it's the back side that's the pretty side, and then they'll do a 180 hop, boop, so that they've covered 360 degrees, so that they are showing everything in all directions, their beautiful colors and stance. But no, it's, it's not every time that they call. It's, it's usually as they landed. Um, not every time, though, but... Yeah. Sadly, they don't do it as often as we would like, or every time they call, because it is such a wonderful display to see. James has arrived at Sydney's waterhole, so let's hope that some animals come down and join you guys there shortly. Yeah. Yes, let's hope the animals come and join us indeed. I absolutely agree. Unfortunately, the animals are not coming to join us. They have decided that they have got better things to do with their lives than come and drink water where Viam might point his camera at them. There are some Egyptian geese there, of course. A hugely exciting bird, uh, roughly 300 meters away from us, so not going to be the best sighting of Egyptian geese. Certainly better parents than the two that used to live at Bifelsook Waterhole. They had seven babies and lost all seven. Anyway, that's right all I can tell you about this waterhole. There's a very pretty line of clouds, though, isn't there, the um? Mm hmm Yes. And that's the sort of storm cloud, the front end of it, as it comes in here. Right, we're going to head along now the Bifosso Cut Line, which is this road that we're on now. And for those of you who are new viewers, remember that we are not able to go north of this road. Everything to the south of us is where we can go. And that is a perfectly normal thing on these game reserve areas for there to be areas of... Um, areas where we can't go and uh, areas where humans are, are not allowed to traverse, but you can see there are no fences between us and Bifelstok, and that means the animals can come and go as they please, which is wonderful. And it allows us for great space. And it allows the animals great space. Now, Raybo One, you think, you want to know why, or do I think that the hyena didn't call for assistance when it was being haplessly attacked yesterday afternoon? Let me show you what happened to everybody, and then I'll answer the question. I was parked like this. Just exactly like that. And that's what the sighting looked like. My head was in the way until Brian hit it and I got out of the way. 
and the hyena was pinned underneath that peltiforum bush there, uh, where those franklins are. Let me go uh, go there and reenact the reenact the great affair that occurred here. And the hyena was set upon by wild dogs, ten of them, and she got right in amongst here. She first was pinned on the ground over there, and the hyenas were biting her backside, and they were taking out chunks, small chunks of her backside, and she would sit on her backside and spin, and they didn't want anything to do with their head, of course. And then she got in amongst here, and she backed up against the tree like this, and she made sure that the dogs couldn't get at her backside, and then she was defended. It was amazing to watch how they were prepared to come in and bite at her bum, but they weren't, didn't want anything to do with her head. Now, Raybo one, you want to know, were they, why didn't, why wasn't she helped, basically? Did she not alarm call? She made a hell of a noise. She made a growling and a howling noise. And why that didn't attract the attentions of the other hyenas, I don't know. I can only suspect that they had been put to flight by the dogs and they'd run off. And maybe the noise that the dogs were making uh, distracted the hyenas um, from the noise that the hyena was making itself. I don't know. But certainly no one came back to help her. There was a suspicion that perhaps she was from a different clan, but I don't believe that was the case. I recognized her as the scar-backed female, and she slunk off down through there towards where the den used to be, or where the den is. I think it's still there, but there was no activity there this morning. Anyway, that's what happened underneath this weeping wattle bush. Put that back in there. Do you like how I did that, Liam? You see that? Good. On we go. I'm just not sure if I'm hearing the name correctly. I think it's Dorf. Is it Dorf, Nikki? D-O-R-T-H, Dorf. You're in Pittsburgh and you want to know where the pond is located. I think you're talking about the, the water hole we just went past. It's on the very northwestern fringes of our traversing area. I think I spotted a bird. A very confiding bird that we watched this morning. There we go. That is the European roller. Just sharpening his beak. And amazing this morning in the sun. Of course, the sun is now behind the clouds. But in the sun, this bird practically shines. Its blue is so incredibly bright, but without, in the flat light, it doesn't. And that is because the blue is not created by a pigment in the skin. It's created by a scattering of light caused by various complicated arrangements of keratin and melanin within the feathers. And that's why they look very bright in the sun and they look completely dull when the light is flat. Very nice. Thank you, Vian. So, Dorf, that pond, as you put it, or waterhole, is in the very northwestern corner of our traversing area. It's, it's almost, basically, it's the edge of the Sabi Sands. The gate that we go in and out of is just beyond there. And we can't, obviously, go towards it. We can sort of park on the boundary and have a look. It's often very... Uh, be useful to do that because there are often elephants and buffalo and things coming down to drink and it's one of the last remaining large bodies of water that there is in the area hello this is candace everyone hello candace candace is the general manager of juma you're on live television you yeah, that's Candace's daughter, of course. Yeah, and ah, all the Florence. Juma staff members. <laughs> We're on a bit of a Juma Isaac. drive. Uh, how's it going? Tisha. Hey, everyone's here. Um, uh, pretty good, thank you. Good. Yes. Are you uh, just on a drive, are you? Yeah. Yes. A little bit okay. of downtime. Yes. We'll have a good time. Thank you. Marvellous. You Enjoy too. your drive. Bye. Get down on Anna. Ole TV, especially. Ole TV. Yeah, Ole TV. 
Besides all the Juma staff, some of whom I know and some of whom I don't know. Uh, Flo Rider in the middle there, Florence, is, helps us out at our camp. And Isaac is the maintenance man, and Tisha at the back is also maintenance. That's quite an interesting thought. You say, could it be that the Scarback female is a subordinate female? We know that she probably is a, a subordinate female, and that therefore she was not, um, you know, no one bothered to come and help her. I think that's actually a really interesting thought, Romy. So, yeah, it could well be that... Oh, this road is terrible. Let me slow down a bit. It could well be that the Scarback female is so subordinate that the others just didn't bother to come back and help when they heard her yowling the way she did. It was a terrifying sound, it really was. A throaty, growling roar. Oh, fascinating thought that, Remy. Yeah, well possible. And uh, Darlene in New Hampshire, you noticed the jackal, the black-backed jackal there, and you say, is it normal that they should be so close to wild dogs and hyenas uh, and sort of nipping in and amongst because it's much smaller than both of them? It's, it is, that's normal behavior for them, yes. They're very cunning and they'll nip in and take a bite and then nip out again and then go back in. What was much more unusual was the fact that he was there at all. I haven't seen a black-backed jackal in the Sabi Sands, I don't think, for the last ooh, almost 10 years. So that was the most amazing thing for me. And I suspect that they're far more common in the Manuleti and then certainly in the Timbavati, they're in every single clearing. And I suspect he was just a, maybe a youngster who's come south and heard the commotion and thought he'd just try and cash in and did a very good job of it. That's why I was so excited by it, because I haven't seen one for so long. And they're not endangered at all. I mean, they're all over the country, certainly the central parts of the country, and every clearing in the Kalahari has got a, a black-backed jackal pair living in it. And in fact, a really wonderful story, you might be able to find it on YouTube. There, are, um, there was a story at Mombo, which is one of the wilderness safaris camps up in Botswana. It's one of the kind of premier safari destinations in Botswana. And they had a black-back jackal pair on the airstrip. And they didn't have any wild dogs for a long time. And then a single female wild dog came into the area just about as the jackal pair gave birth to some little pups. And the wild dog basically joined them. She became their, their feeder. She used to kill and regurgitate for the pups. And she would interact with the adults and play with them. She would nurse the, or not nurse in the, um, not nurse as in suckle, but she would nurse the pups. She'd stay around the den site and look after them and make sure that no other predators came near there when the adults went off foraging. It was a most absolutely amazing situation where she didn't have a pack of her own, so she just kind of made one up with some jackals. So there we go. I mean, we had that question about interspecific play behavior, so that wasn't so much play behavior, but it's completely just different species coming together and forming a bond of a kind of mutual benefit. And then at one stage also, there was a hyena that joined them. That's right. A hyena female joined them. She used to stay further off because she would basically just steal everything they killed. But they could often be found lying very close to each other. It was amazing. I haven't heard of it before or since. get a view from the top up here. Unbelievable. Scott Dyson has managed to find another nest and he's going to show you what it looks like with his GoPro. Hello everyone, welcome back. And I've just got my selfie stick ready and here we go. There's a little bit of a delay on it, so you'll be able to hear me speaking before the picture actually arrives onto my phone. And the reason why I've got the selfie stick out is that I found a bird's nest. That's up. Go, 
40 years old. Um, yeah, they said some snow, but it didn't come right to us, so it fell down and blocked the... Okay, well, it appears we're having some audio issues. It looks like our battery died, Brian. Finally. Mm, looks on still. Does it? Yeah. Uh, it does. Anyway, I will shout. There's a bird's nest in the tree, and I'm about to put the selfie stick camera above it. Let us see what is in here. Maybe there'll be some baby birdies. Just gonna try and be gentle in case there are. Is there anything to see? Yay or nay? Yay or nay? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. No eggs. No eggs. All right, let's go. Not sure what kind of a nest it's from, um, but we thought we'd call you across to come and check. But what can you do? You win some, you lose some. I was hoping there was going to be something in there that we could spy on with the selfie stick. All right. OK, well, we're going to try and get the audio uh, up and running again. Not too sure what, where the problem could uh, have arisen. It appears like this funny microphone is not doing its job. So we're going to send you back to James while we try and work out what's what. Just a short time with us while they sort out that sound problem that they had there. Um, it sounds really fascinating, I'm pretty jealous to be honest. Scott's ability to spot and find these birds' nests is quite unparalleled in the annals of ornithological history. Right, we are now getting into the area where we think maybe, perhaps, could be the Nkaupuma pride as a kill. There is some water. Now, you see, mm, there is a pan full of water. You saw a buffalo with Scott earlier in such a pan. And I don't know why, therefore, they went to Biffle's Hook to have their drink last night when they could have come to that little puddle of green spirogyra. Anyway, for the moment, nothing in there. Let's keep going. We're not too far from the dam. We'll go and have a look. I also want to try and see the black-crowned night herons. Genevieve, you want to know about the effect of sun on the surface of the water and whether it has or could act as a mild disinfectant. Um, no, I would say it does precisely the opposite, Genevieve. I think what it does is provide a space and the warmth for bacteria to thrive. They wouldn't thrive in cold water. I also think that it, um, it provides uh, the light, obviously, for that algae, for example, to grow. That algae is photosynthesizing, and it can't do that without sunlight. So, no, I don't think it disinfects the water at all. Certainly wouldn't be... I would far sooner eat, drink, if I didn't know whether water was safe to drink or not, I would sooner drink cold water than I would hot water. And by hot, I mean sort of tepid, lukewarm water. It's an interesting question, that, though. The sun has a profound effect, of course. As we all know, after Leo's speech yesterday evening, this is the hottest year in world history. Quite something, that. OK, we are approaching the dam now. Hold thumbs that there's some kind of a mammal there. Mvula. David, you're in Surrey. It's a very nice place to be in England. I have been to Surrey. I've stayed there in a little village called Guildford, or just outside. Guildford's not so little. And, David, you're worried about... Well, you're not worried. You're interested in spitting cobras, and you want to know if they can bite. Yes, they can absolutely bite. The spitting is a defensive mechanism, but biting is what they would use to kill something if they wanted to eat it. 
They've got a combined venom. Most cobras have what we call a neurotoxic venom. And that neurotoxic venom uh, is like a mumba venom. It will paralyze the victim. But a spitting cobra has combined cytotoxic and neurotoxic venom. There is a gray go-away bird. There's an alarm calling at something. But nothing particularly obvious. Maybe it is a spitting cobra in the bottom of this bush. Ah, oh, looking down into the middle of the bush. That's interesting. So, David, the cytotoxic venom is what would cause the eyes to really flare up in terrible pain if it does spit in your eyes. And if left untreated, could create blindness, but doesn't always. And then the neurotoxic venom would be the venom that it really uses to kill its prey. Just drive around this bush a little. I wonder if they, maybe it's talking to the other go away bird. They don't tend to have much in the way of uh, wide vocal range. Well, there are four of them there, Viam. You see that? Four grey go away birds. Mr. Moustache, you are now in Iceland again. I find this astonishing. Um, I forget where you, I think you were in Denmark last time we spoke to you. Anyway, you're in Iceland now. Uh, somehow you managed to watch us, which is marvelous, and you always ask us great questions. You want to know if, some, if different species can understand each other, if there is some kind of interspecies communication that goes on out here, or is it all just like a foreign language? Mr. Moustache, there's no question that different species understand each other's alarm calls. Absolutely, birds will look at squirrels. A leopard understands when a squirrel or a bird is alarm calling at it. Uh, an alarm calling um, go away bird would create consternation to squirrels in the area. They'll look at what the go away bird is alarm calling at. So yes, definitely, there is a certain element of, and there's a car behind us. Uh, look what he's alarming at. Yeah. It's that bird up there. Oh. She looks like a step eagle. It's quite interesting. So, Mr. Moustache, yes, certainly they can understand each other's alarm calls. Uh, I think it's just standard issue Wahlbergs. It isn't, no. Very rounded head. It's not a Wahlberg's eagle, you know. I think that is a step eagle. Look at the gape. The gape is the extent of the mouth. Oh, you won't be able to see it from here. Anyway, I'm going to call step eagle on that, mainly because, of course, you are unable to call me wrong on it because you can't really see it from where you're sitting. That very rounded shape. So we're going to call that a step eagle. I'll just quickly show you a picture. And, Verney, you want a, an adult batelier? Well, I actually know where some adult bataliers live. We will head down that way. Um, let me just quickly show you the step eagle before we continue. Yes, we've seen it. Thank you. Um, there he is. The Eurasian step eagle. And identifiable from this distance because he's uniformly dark like that unlike a tawny, which would be mottled. And also, I can just see with my powerful binoculars that gape, which is basically the lips of the bird that extend beyond the middle of the eye. I know you won't believe that with my powerful binoculars, aged roughly 568 years, I'm able to see that, but I can. Let's continue. Yeah, where's Mvula? You said he was going to be here. Drainage line somewhere. Oh, is he? Okay, good. Well, we'll look, we'll look carefully into the drainage line then, won't we? Now, the night heron was in these trees this morning. And I want to see the night heron too. Let us keep a, a close beady eye, and for those of you who don't know what on earth I'm talking about, there was a pair of white 
night herons, well, they're, they're called black crown night herons, but they're white birds, black crowns. They eat fishes, as do most herons. But they're quite an unusual bird. You're just looking for leopard, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See where Scott went in there. I think given our dodgy... Our signal should be okay now. We ease our way to the top. No night herons just yet, maybe at night. And no Kahuma pride and no tracks of any in Kahuma pride, so I don't know where they are. We'll pop back here a little bit later and just see if they don't come out from wherever it is that they are hiding. The tracks there. Uh, something to get it. Something cattish, like a cat or a hyena. Oh, lionish. Lionish? Fresh? No, no, no. Okay. Viam has spotted a lion track. Given the parlous state of mammals at the moment, I think it's definitely worth just having a look. Could be anything. Could be anything. It could be anything. All right. Let's go back to Scott. He's got a lovely little bird to show you. I'll try and find out what this is. Well spotted owl, it's fluttered somewhere into these bushes. I'm hoping we're going to get you another glimpse of it. That same tiny owlet that we saw earlier, the same type of owlet at least. Where have we fluttered off to? Oh, I think it may have dodged us, folks. It initially flew from the first perch where it landed. And I'm... Oh, there it is. It's directly at 3 o'clock. Yeah, I can see it. Good. On the top right of your screen, it's looking straight at us. Look at how awesome this is. Well done, Brian. And this is a tiny, tiny little owlet. You can see it's got fake eyes on the back of its head. It's looking at us now. Look at that. That indicates to us that it is, in fact, the pearl-spotted owlet. It could have been, like I said earlier, its cousin, the barred owlet. They look very similar, especially when you've just got a very vague view of them like this. And it's tiny, tiny, tiny. It's only about 120 grams, I'm told. I've never weighed one myself. And look at the way it's peering around. It is very, very alert. Are you looking for a meal? Are you simply concerned for our presence here? Sure, we got so lucky to see this bird. As I lift my head up away from the little monitor screen and look for it in real life, I can't see anything. Great. Well, I'm happy that we got to show you one of these little critters after that it evaded us earlier when we had those other birds alarm calling at it. Now, this little owlet does not have little ear tufts that often owls will have. Yesterday we saw the white-faced scops owl, which had those ear tufts. And Pamela's just asked, do we have any great horned owls in the Kruger National Park, and I think, I'm guessing by great horned owls, you just mean owls with those big kind of, what people assume are ear tufts, they actually aren't. The ears on, on owls are often directly to the left and right of those respective eyes. And that's why they've got that very big round face that acts like a satellite dish. So the ears are usually, like I say, just to the sides of their eyes, and those little tufts are merely for camouflage, and. I'm not sure if there's a specific kind of owl called a great horned owl that you get back home, Pamela, or if it's just, like I say, referring to those little 
tufts on their head. We do have a few head tufty owls or horned owls, which I'll be able to show you in the book. Oh, is it fluttered off? Mm. Okay, good. I was busy getting the horned owlets. Well, I'm guessing what you are asking for here, Pamela, are the owls that I'm going to show you now in the book. So some, yes, will have uh, little ear tufts. Or, sorry, ear tufts is the wrong word because it's not where their ears are necessarily. Um, so there are those little tufts. The southern white-faced scopsaw that we saw yesterday also had those little tufts erected, not lying flat, like in that picture. And then the spotted eagle owl is another version, as well as the rose eagle owl. They have those kind of little tufts. But the other owls don't. Not the other owls of this area. But very good. Well done, Brian. Hello, Turf Pro. Glad you're still on safari with us. You've been on since the beginning of the drive. You would like to know how on earth did I spot that bird? I saw it fly in front of us um, across the road from right to left, and that's when I asked Nikki to get you guys to jump onto our vehicle because there was a chance we were going to find it again. And then we just got lucky to spot it in that bush, but we, we, we knew it was somewhere in the general area. But luck was on our side. Cedia, haven't heard your name before. Oh, Brian spotted another bird there. And what a great view this is. This is a grey go, go away bird. Not looking too happy, are you? What's the problem? Not enough berries to eat at the moment. Yeah. Shame. There is not much food there. Frugivorous birds, usually. And it's not the fruitiest of summers. Maybe that's why it's a little bit glum. There's another one calling somewhere nearby. I can just hear it going. Rrr, rrr. Ah. Yeah, it's right behind there. Oh, it's right behind. Let's see if we can't creep forward a little bit. Ah, there you are. We caught you. You can fly, but you cannot hide. Not when Brian is on camera. We've still got you. Sorry, CD, you would like to know how many owls we get in this part of the Kruger National Park. We get the pearl spotted, the barred. Those are the two smallest. Then the ones that we've actually seen, uh, Varro's eagle owl, spotted eagle owl, that's four. I'm not sure if we've got you any views of the barn owl. Um, so that's five. There's also grass owl, marsh owl, pals fishing owl, so there we're up to eight. And the wood owl, nine. So there's about nine or ten owls that we do get in this general area, but we com most commonly see the pearl spotted, then probably the burrows, then probably the bard, then probably the spotted eagle owl. We haven't been very lucky with owls recently. I don't know where they Hiding. Oh, the scopsal, the two different scopsal, the African scopsal and the um, white faced scopsal that we saw yesterday. So there we're up to 12, I think. So, see, there are many different owls, but we don't spend too much time out after dark. can be confusing is that some of the birds' names have changed, see there? So what some people may call a giant eagle owl, which is old school, means the same as a new school ornithologist calling it the Burroughs eagle owl. Interesting Mr. Burrow, he has got the giant eagle owl changed to his name, Verro's eagle owl, as well as the black eagle got changed to the Verro's eagle. Two spectacular birds of prey. 
Well, Mr. Vero must have been an important ornithologist that has been re-remembered. Okay, our signal's getting a bit shaky. We are on the western boundary. Goodbye. Goodbye back to James. No, come on. Okay, we are just driving around Biffleshoek Dam area, still trying to see if we can find tracks of the lions. I don't think anyone drove this road today, so that's why I'm come, come, come down here. Just one second, there was a beautiful little lamb in there. We put him on his own. We go back a bit. This means reverse. Henry, oh, that's, that'll do this little in there. That's fine. A little Nala lamb. That's tiny, tiny. That can't be more than a week or two old. Those classic ears of the tragolathid or spiral horned antelope. So nice. And they are that big, of course, because, as the great big bad wolf said, they need them for hearing, all the better to hear you with. They live in thick bush, and so those big ears are like specialized natural radar dishes that pick up sound from all angles. Hmm. Uh, we've had enough of that, have we? Yeah. Fair enough. I'm afraid we haven't actually found any lion tracks at all. And so I don't know where these things have gone. But I don't think anyone drove this road today, so that's why it's a good idea just to check. Ooh. Something jumped onto my hat. And so I have seen the Nguhuma Pride on this road quite often, and often actually eating something. Maybe? The vultures that we saw around there today have disappeared, so whatever it is that they were sitting there for has either been devoured or they were just sitting there because it was a good place to rest. So I doubt the Inkahumas are sitting there on a great big buffalo or anything like that. Nothing around here. My next port of call will be to head to the Cheetah Cut Line, where I know there is a mistletoe plant, and I wanted to show you about the fruit there and how it, is, it, it grows and the specialized bird that eats it. And I was reading about fruit-eating birds today. Before we carry on, let's just look at this little flock of magpie shrikes. Look at them all. And you can see exactly which ones are adults and which ones are not. The one in the middle there is an adult with his long tail, the one who just had his morning, um, well, constitutional. And the others, you can see their tails are much shorter, will be this year's hatchlings or fledglings. And they're just sitting there kind of chilling out, enjoying the view, I think. <laughs> Preening away. And that preening, of course, is massively important. Whenever you see a bird running its beak over its feathers, it's not doing it just for the sake of having a, a, a scratch. It's normally doing it in order to realign the feathers, the barbs, and the barbicels, and the barbules, which are the different parts of the feathers, and realign them. And you can just hear in the background there the bird that Scott just saw. The spotted outlet. I'll just see if I can make him call again. How cool is that? 
it's the first one I've managed to get to respond to me here. I'm going to call him once more and see if he will come towards us. Let me wet my lips a bit more. Anyway, I'm so glad he responded to me. Makes me feel very good. Nice, likes to, um, scratches the ego a little bit, you know? Beautiful bird, you've now seen him, and you've heard him. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Ah, now, Vernie, you want to know about Pills, fishing owls, and why don't we get them in this reserve? Um, kudu. Oh, yes, look at that. This is amazing. Look at this tiny little kudu. It's a little one that's been left by its parents. I'm sure its parents have gone off to have a drink. Its parents, its mother, would have gone off to have a drink. And a lot of these large antelope, the waterbuck do this, the kudu, they will leave their youngsters to go off and have a drink because they know that predators will concentrate around water holes so they leave them lying under a tree like this. And if a predator were to come past here, the kudu would just hide, flatten its ears down against the ground and lie dead still just like it's doing now. Isn't that cool? That's really amazing. It looks like it's just having a chilled out time, but it's actually frozen there, if not in terror, certainly in just about terror. He actually just looks like he's having an afternoon snooze, doesn't he? But he isn't. Very cool. There have been quite a few little kudu calves around at the moment and some waterbuck calves, and they do tend to give birth later than the impala do. But they've been born into a pretty tough time. Not moving. Anyway, Bernie, you were asking about Pell's Fishing Owls. Pell's Fishing Owls, for those of you who don't know, very large brown bird. And the beautiful... Beaut sorry, excuse me. Um, beautiful Pell's Fishing Owl is found in the Sabi sand sometimes, especially along the rivers. Um, but not often. They like permanent water with still pools where they can hunt from a perch at night. But you do find them in the Sabi sands from time to time. I don't think you'll ever find them around here because we don't have rivers with large trees overhanging them. I think the call was to link to Scott. Is that correct, Nicola? With a bee eater? Go to Scott. See you now. Finally, a decent view of a European bee eater. They have got the most awesome coloration. You'll notice probably at the moment the brightest color you can see is that yellow under its beak. If it turns and faces us, it's got a beautiful bluish tinge, like a bluey, greeny tinge on their underbelly. And we've been hearing these birds. It's the one that's calling now. So often. And we've shown you them flying, again, so often, but seldom have we got you a good view of them perched like this. Um, I'm hoping if and when it does take off, what, let's, let's take a gamble here. Let's drive up to it slowly. That way we're going to be able to get you a closer, tighter frame. And hopefully Nikki will be able to slow motion when it takes off so you can see its bright blue coloration. Ideally, it would have flown towards us, not away from us, but at least we got it in the bag. And we might have another crack at it. I've seen where it's landed. Which is, which is harder than you think, actually, because I'm watching the monitor down here. 
as it flies away. So then uh, it, it's, it, it made no sense me saying that, but it does make sense. Just make you guys realize I haven't lost my marbles completely. It can be quite tricky looking down like this, watching what the leopard does, watching what the bird does, thinking about what to say, and then you look up and you're like, where am I? Where'd the leopard go? You don't even know if it's on the left or the right of the vehicle anymore when you get engrossed enough in the sighting. It is one of the hardest things to get used to, the monitor. Because naturally, when you guide with guests, you look out with your guests into the bush, not into the monitor. <laughs> Hello, Whitney. You would like to know with all the turning around and looking back at camera, how many non-bendy trees have I driven into? One, that was an epic crash. I drove straight into a ginormous marula tree. Big, big tree. Solid, huge. I looked up and it was too late. I don't even know if I looked up, but just donk into the tree. Again, we were trying to get you a view of, I think, a lilac breasted roller. Um, so I've had one good crash that some of you will remember. It was hilarious. Um, I don't know, Matt, the video will be somewhere. It's just, I don't know who's going to be able to find it timelessly. Although some of our viewers have got a very good archiving system, so somebody may be able to find out exactly where that crash is. It's hilarious, Whitney. But yeah, thankfully only one crash in my time here so far. about to drive up onto the Arethusa Dam Wall. The camp, you'll notice, is spread out on the opposite side there. And you'll see these little birds feeding below us, chasing one another around. Are quite interesting characters called the helmeted guinea fowl. Look at their bright blue heads, spotted feathers. Awesome. Awesome creatures. Oh, that one's enjoying some grass seeds there on the run. Speaking of running, they can run incredibly quickly. They often decide to run when being attacked by predators, aerial predators, even birds of prey, as opposed to fly, because they're not the fastest of flyers. Very good. Also, very good with regards to alarm calls. That's not them calling, that's a Franklin calling nearby, one of their relatives. But when they do let off their alarm call, it can be heard from far away and it can be a very good indicator that danger is near. Tony in London, you'd like to know if we get an algae that you get over in the UK, which apparently kills frogs, called blue-green algae. Not that I've seen. Um, that's certainly not to say that it doesn't occur in Africa, but I have never come across it. Sounds nasty, though, Tony. Thanks for letting us know about that. Sunita in India and I think Sunita might be planning her attack on how exactly or what exactly she needs to do in order to become a guide and Sunita it's not difficult at all you basically need uh, no qualifications in order to to start a training course um, you can 
have got a degree in anything. I got a degree in property development before coming and doing my six month training course in the bush. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, that's all it really takes is a six month course to get your national requirements regarding the tests you need to do. There's a organization called FGASA, F-G-A-S-A, Field Guides Association of South Africa. And they are the kind of medium that you go through in order to become legal to guide in South Africa. Or at least it was, it may have changed ever so slightly, but it's not difficult. Usually a six month course uh, gets you into the driver's seat at the lodge and thereafter, you know, it takes time depending on the individual to gain experience and then grow up and work at fancier lodges where you may be uh, allowed to drive around more pristine wilderness areas or have higher paying guests generally that will help you earn more money. It's a gratuity based job. Your salary covers your bar tab as a guide and you rely very heavily on gratuities. Um, so obviously the, the more experienced you become, the, the more the more fancy the lodge you can work at and that way you'll be in a better position to earn better money. We've got a, a runner. I think we'll be able to catch up to it before it disappears though. It is a gigantic, gigantic leopard tortoise. It's temporarily stopped, sizing us up. Have you been running away with some food in your mouth? Looks like it. It looks like it's got some leaves dangling out the side of its beak-like mouth. I've got a And off it goes. Shame, it can't be an easy time of year for the tortoises. Imagine not being able to move huge distances in a time like this where food is so scarce and more importantly, water. That's why often when we do have, when we, when we have had recent rains, it's the tortoises you see flocking to the little puddles in the road to quench their thirst. Hello, Judy, who is a teacher, who is getting very excited for her class to also join us on these live safaris. We're going to be doing, or focusing on answering a lot of their questions in, I think, tomorrow and the next day. And Judy, we are also very, very excited for that. And hopefully more and more schools and classrooms around the world will also join in on this wonderful experience. I could think of nothing better than my teacher telling me, OK, it's Safari Live time now. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit biased because I'm involved in this wonderful product, but also because I do love this safari experience in general and any way to be on safari whether it's safari live or your own safaris wherever you may be going around the world it's always a wonderful journey and that's what the word safari means the kiswahili word meaning journey obviously in our case it's a journey through the african wilderness in Jacksonville you'd like to know what the local tribe people is uh, is called in South Africa and you've said it's in Kenya it's the Maasai people um, there's many tribes in South Africa as well as Kenya so Maasai are one of the tribes that live in Kenya but not the only one there are many different uh, tribes 
of which I'm battling to come up uh, with the names of the different tribes and groups. Oh! But you get the Takana tribes in the far north of uh, Kenya, you get the Samburu tribesmen in the central parts of Kenya, and the Maasai are further to the south, stretching into Tanzania. There are other smaller variations and kind of groups within those large uh, tribes, you could say. In South Africa, we've got nine different African languages and basically a tribe to go with each one. In this part of South Africa, it's the Shangan people, and the Shangan people stretch into Mozambique. You also get the Zulu people further south of us. The squirrel that's just alarm called. It could be at anything, but it could be at something important like a leopard. Um, so yeah, the Shangan people are the area in this people, and the Zulu people are further so south, the Tosa people are down to the Cape, so many different tribes within South Africa. There's some exciting news, and you're going to have to head across to James's vehicle to find out exactly what it is. Well, the exciting news, everybody, is that we can see an enormous grey cloud coming in from the west. It's really exciting, isn't it, Viem? Yes. Well, how do you feel? Excited? Uh, a little bit. A little bit excited. Oh, good. Viem, look at that on the road. What do you see? Um... Uh -huh. Lions! <laughs> now... Everybody, what I think this is, I, if I'm not mistaken, and I have, we haven't been any closer than you are right now, I think this is the missing Nkuhuma lioness and one of the Birminghams. I might be entirely wrong, but I think that's what's going on here. Nicola has already managed to identify that this is not the lioness or a lioness that is missing. So let's just have a look, see here what's going on. Nicola, tell us how you identify this lioness immediately. I see. It is Nicola's, it is Nicola's opinion that this lioness has got slightly odd-shaped eyes. Slightly slanted eyes. I can I see exactly what she means, actually. I haven't noticed it before, but yeah, I would agree with that completely. Now, this male looks like he's been mauled by his brothers. Look at his face. He's absolutely been smashed. I wonder, I'm pretty sure they must be mating. And I wonder if she hasn't had a go at him as well. Now, I haven't seen the Birminghams for so long. I don't know which one this is. But that is a big, nasty fight they've been having. She's calling. Listen. You hear that? It's a gentle contact cord gentle contact call, hoping the others will come out. She's just going, oh, it's that quiet. Oh. Now, VMP, I know you'll desperately want to do a virtual reality shoot. What I'm going to do is move in just in here, and then if the others do come out of the bush, you'll be able to push record. <laughs> spot of luck everyone this is the one road of course we didn't come down earlier today mm. and <laughs> Kat and Raisa you're extremely excited by the fact that we're looking at a male lion finally I am totally with you on that, I agree. It is wonderful. But look how damaged he is. 
He's got cuts and bruises all over him. I don't think, I mean, some of that might be from her. You know, during the mating, it can become quite aggressive. It's not quite as aggressive as it is with leopards, though. That, no, that shoulder, that shoulder, and he's a huge wound on his belly. Look at that. That looks like it could have been inflicted by a buffalo. It looks like a big puncture wound. Now, so any of you out there who recognize this male lion, I'd love to know which Birmingham you think it is. MP, let me go a little bit further forward for you, and you can get a slightly, you won't have to avoid my head, my big fat bonce. There we go. That's better. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? So this lioness is not very old. You can see she's still got a very pink nose. And that means she's well under six years old. The slant-eyed pink nose, we can call her for now. And this male is the very scarry Birmingham. And I know, like I say, a lot of you keep up with updates from Ancora, where these guys have been seen a lot of late. In various other parts of the Sabi Sands. And if you have some picture identicates of them, it would be fascinating to know. Please post them, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and tell us which of the Birmingham boys do you think this is. I'm just going to quickly call them in on the radio. I know Steph did, but let me just quickly do it. The station's one male, one female line, static on Cheetah Cut Line, about 300 metres to the south of the junction with the Bufflesaw Cut Line. She's in absolutely fine condition. Go. Sorry, my radio is really soft. One male, one female lion, cheetah cut line, 300 meters south of the junction with Piffles Hook cut line. They are static on the road. Sorry, excuse me, everyone. It looks like he's a female from the Nkuhumas, and I don't know who the male is. Must be a Birmingham, I think. Now, this is Johan speaking. And he's calling us from not far from here, and he says there is another Birmingham male to the right-hand side of your picture, basically. Put him there. Completely relaxed. Yeah, no, he's in the, he's been in the wars, this fellow. And this is the lot of the male line. Of course, he's designed to fight. So I, I mean, I'm pretty sure, given the fact that they weren't here this morning. And we did drive up and down here quite a lot. You copying your seat? No, sorry. I, I unplugged myself by mistake. Go ahead, Nikki. Sorry about that. And Paul Rizzo, you want to know if this, if this male could possibly be the one with the scar across his face that Brent saw? Yes, could well be. I mean, he's definitely got a nasty, nasty set of scars all the way down the left-hand side of his face. I mean, a lot of them look quite recent, though. I wonder if he hasn't been in a fairly serious scrap fairly recently. Go ahead. Like I say, didn't find them this morning. 
and we were here relatively late and I suspect quite strongly therefore that they are mating and they will move around a little bit if they're mating and they would have been, you know what, they would have been in these bushes not far from here at all. Hmm. Gerda, you say lions and a cloud with possible rain coming in. What could be more exciting? Well, I agree completely. What could possibly be more exciting? While they're sleeping, let's head across to Scott. He's got something very nice to show you, and we'll wait here and see if they do anything. We just thought we'd bring you across to have a look at this giraffe silhouette here at the Arethusa airstrip, a large open expanse, which is quite a rare in the Sabi Sands. There we go, there's the windsock that you can see. Well done to James, who has got you into a wonderful spot with those lion, and what a surprise that is. So very happy for all of you, and let's hope that some action unfolds there. Maybe they will be making love, and I'm certainly very jealous of the situation you're in. We're going to send you back there and continue on our way. Our plan is to try and find a leopard so that we can try and get some action of this in this end of the safari as well. Otherwise, we're going to battle to compete with those lions that James has found. Cool. Good luck. Goodbye. Right, everybody. Uh, you, go, you go to the lions. Don't worry about me here. We just want to do a virtual reality shoot here with this thing on the front of the car, but this <laughs> little beeping device, which is uh, supposed to be a very fancy sinking device, is supposed to be making a beeping sound, but it is not. Liam, shall I throw it out of the car? No, it's probably cable. Cable related. Yeah. You get out. <laughs> oh, this is a very clever question. Kaluti from New Franklin. I don't know where New Franklin is. Sounds like an interesting spot to be. You say, could her call be infrasonic? In other words, below the sound waves that we are able to hear. So lower down a wider um, wavelength, a lower frequency. Clearly, yes, there is an element of infrasound in the lion's call, definitely. No question. And it travels along the ground. That's why she pushes her head towards the ground and calls like that. And for us, it'll sound a lot more quiet than it will to a lion listening out for it. So yes, I think that's a really good um, supposition, if you like, that the call there is quite infrasonic. Very nice. And Debbie, yes, of course, you've noticed that his mane is quite dark. And it's, in fact, in, I mean, if you look at him from the front, it's a, almost a black mane. And you say, does that mean that there's a lot of, of testosterone in his body? Yes, it does. It's precisely what it means. There will be lots of testosterone. The more black a lion's mane is, the more testosterone there is in his body. And, of course, the older they get, they do often get a bit darker as they get older. But the amount of testosterone in him is evidenced by the fact that he's clearly not backed down during any of the fights that he's had. He's got no injuries on his backside, indicating that completely unlike that hyena, he was managed to have his business end faced towards his enemies. He didn't turn his back at one stage. You can see he's pristine over there and on his face and shoulders where he fights. He's got all sorts of scars. And he's not very big. I mean, he's a decent-sized male lion, I suppose, but he's nothing like the size of those Matimba chaps who used to roam about these parts. So he's obviously a very brave fellow with testosterone coursing through his body. Sean, you're in Secunda, and you want to know why it is that the lion's skin, oh, here we go, here we go, is gray and black. Um, well, it's gray and black, basically. That's just what the color is. It's gray, their skin. Here we go. 
And look at him, even though he's got those injuries, he's completely walking without any form of limp. She had a limp the last time we saw her, and she's absolutely fine now. It's magnificent. I'm just going to quickly tell the VR what's going on. Lions in front on the road, grey skies above, perhaps some rain. Look at those eyes and the scars on that lion. Let's just see what he does. We originally thought they might be mating. She might be going off to look, in fact, for the rest of her pride. He looks like he's had enough of this. He's very tired. He's lean. Look at, look at his build. He's not... You know, he does, he's not nearly as heavy as those, as those Matimbas, and I think he's probably two years off being as heavy as he's going to be. Hmm. Let's get around the side of him. So there he is to the left, and way up in front there, the female, she's not interested in him. Zoe, we're very close to him now. We're only about three and a half feet from him. He wants to know if he can get those scars from a kill, from being at a kill. Definitely he can, Zoe. Uh, it wouldn't only be in a fight with other males, but certainly over a kill, they will hit each other. But you see, I think this, this to me looks much more severe than that. This looks like he's had a proper conflict. But certainly they can absolutely get sort of bloody marks on their faces from the fights that they have. Isn't he lovely? He's a magnificent fellow. And Sunel, you're in Trinidad, and you said how far away are these lines? Well, this line is about only five feet. Yeah, not a bit more than four feet, maybe five feet from us. He's very relaxed, and he's watching his consort move. Here she goes. have been mating. I don't know. She's definitely looking for... definitely looking for the rest of the pride. She stopped to urinate there. Now, that will be an indication to him. We'll see when he gets there if he ex exhibits that sort of phlegm behavior, if he smells the urine and tries to tell whether she's an estrus or not. I suspect there's an element of that because I don't know why otherwise he'd be following her. Males and females don't necessarily like to be with each other all the time. And that is because males, of course, will steal all of the food from the females. And so they only kind of really want to be around the males when they are mating. And you can see his ears are pinned back. He's listening to us as we move behind him. So I'm just going to keep my distance. I don't want to disturb him or make him go any faster, but they are looking like they're going to cross north into Biffles Hook. So I'm just going to quickly give an update there on the radio. Stations, these two animals are now mobile due north up Cheetah Cat Line. The female has crossed north into Biffles Hook. The male is just behind her. sad unfortunately I think this is going to be the last we are going to see of them <laughs> thank you Martin you say all is forgiven for my complete incompetence at finding anything large and magnificent today simply because we have a Birmingham boy with us I agree I forgive myself even oh that's a nice smell isn't it VM oh grief I'll notice he didn't stop to smell. He's just following her. Now he's going to mark his territory. There he is marking against the tree. She is off in front there, down that road. And I think he's going to follow her straight into Biffles Hook. Maybe he won't. There is another male, and another two males behind us on Torchwood. But he's going to follow his consort, I think. Oh, no, he seems to be in two minds. Don't go that way, fellow. Come this way. When in doubt, have a sleep.
That's so wonderful. Now, There he goes, he's watching something. Dominique, you're in Paris. You might be a new viewer, and if you are, thank you very much for getting hold of us, and thank you for watching. Um, there she is, you can just see her over the top there. Now, Dominique, you want to know if these lions are comfortable with us, with them lying on the road, and what, how would they react if they became uncomfortable? They are completely confident and comfortable. Sorry, just stand by, Steph. They're completely comfortable and completely confident. And what happens is that if they are uncomfortable, like he was slightly there when we were driving up behind him and he flattened his ears back, they do give a behavioral indication. They'll flatten their ears, they might growl, but normally they will just walk away. That's not why he's moving now. That's not why she was moving. She's looking for the rest of her pride and he's just following on because he thinks she might be an estrus. That's gonna be the last of it, I'm afraid. So now we'll see if we can find some tracks, but the very fact. Can I just give it that? Hmm? No. Sorry, I'm just uh, taking instructions from my friend VM. We'll just try and find a fresh track for you that is obvious in this light. Nice one. Is there one that side? Okay, let's just turn around. While we do that, let me quickly get hold of Steph. He was trying to get hold of me. He found these lines. Steph, go ahead. Let's quickly go across to Scott. There is some good news here. I'll keep you posted. Very happy that you had some wonderful views of those two lines. Interesting that the one is so battered. This is a very rare bird, everyone, called a southern ground hornbill. And we just saw it fly up into this big dead tree. I'm guessing it may be planning on spending the night here. And before it goes to bed, it looks like it's going to be doing some cleaning after a day out in the field. They'll kind of act like turkeys. They walk along the ground looking for food. They eat all manner of prey, insects, reptiles, snakes, lizards, frogs, baby birds, eggs, you name it, they'll eat it. Interesting that this one is alone. They usually fly in small family flocks. Um, I'm just going to ask Brian quickly to speak to it in Hornbill. Um, here goes. This is the noise they make. Brian. Brian is very talented when it comes to making various noises. And that was a very good rendition of the ground hornbill. I'm hoping this one is going to respond to Brian. But it doesn't look like it's interested to chat to us. Let's have one more try. Let's have one more try. Ask it something different, Brian. Okay. Say something else. I think my else. dialect is wrong, though. I think... Your wrong accent. Yeah, wrong at accent. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Got its head turned there. Imagine it just burst out into song now. Come on. <gasps> I thought it was going to think about doing it there. Maybe it's just preparing itself. Come on. Come on. It looks like it wants to do something. Is it building up? Is it building up for a vocalization? Almost like it's filling up its bagpipes. Come on, come on. What are you doing? You're looking, you're looking like you're wanting to do something. Scotty. Or are you just posturing? Hello, Doug. Uh, just a ground hornbill up in the tree, yeah? Hi, uh, Superman. Thanks. I'll leave you to it. Copy. See you later. So Doug just arrived behind us and was wondering what we were watching. But he obviously feels his guests will not appreciate this bird. 
Are you going to regurgitate something? It's calling. It's calling. Keep quiet, everyone. Listen carefully. And it's just like, I guess. believe it. Brian, the hornbill whisperer, has finally coaxed this bird into calling for us. It's calling very softly. It may increase volume. you guys managed to speak to a pearl spotted owlet earlier with James. We are becoming one with the animals of Juma. I've never ever seen this before. I've heard them calling a huge amount of times, but I've never seen it. This is fascinating. Seems like it's building up momentum. Getting a bit louder. And Raisa, you are right. Wow, Brian, you are awesome. When we first came across this hornbill, we knew that you guys were with those lions and thought, there's no ways we're going to get this guy on screen. But I guess that is the beauty of being on safari. You just never know what's going to happen. It flew up off the road, landed perfectly in this tree. And I think is now asking Brian out on a date. An interesting date, though, because it looks like, to me, that it is a male. You cannot see any small blue patches on that red throat patch, the gula patch, which is really inflated, so you can see very clearly now. A female will have a blue patch within the middle of that red gula patch, which I'll show you in the book afterwards. So I think this is a lonely male, hoping to find some ladies and maybe start a flock of his own. Well, what's interesting with this is that you can also tell that it's the male simply from the call. The female's got a different call, and it's a response to the male's call. He's currently saying, honey, come home. Honey, come home. Honey, come home. And then the female would respond, no, not yet. Do, do, do. So merely from the call, you can hear that it's the male. You know, usually together, like they are in their family flocks, you'll hear the female immediately respond, and he's desperately begging, Honey, come home. Willow Wanderer, who's watching in the UK, this is your favorite South African bird, and You've been lucky enough to see them several times in the Kruger Park, but I bet you you've never seen them doing this, Will I wonder. This is absolutely awesome. And there's some beautiful orange glows coming from the west, just below the bird. A picturesque scene. 
in in yes. stop to go and doing some preening there. But hang on, maybe my feathers are out of line and that's why the lady's not coming home. Although it looks like the bagpipes are filling up again. Beautiful. Gen B, interesting that you've noticed that you think that this hornbill's looking a little bit thin. And I'm just going to try and move the vehicle a little bit. We've got this road blocking this. Somebody trying to get past. Good, just try and get out of the way. Oh, well, that's perfect. We'll be able to try and get into another spot once this other vehicle has passed by. Gen B, you've noticed that the hornbill is looking a little bit thin. And I think that's merely due to the fact that it's uh, in an awkward position that you've never seen one in before. They're usually walking along the ground. Are you? Um, they're usually in an awkward position. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, they're usually walking along the ground where they'll be able to kind of hold their body a little bit differently to when they are perched on a branch like that. So I think it's merely the fact that it's perched in an interesting spot. Oh, Brown, quickly, it's coming, flying over. Look at this. Awesome. What a way to finish off the sighting. Well done, Brian, there. Um, Sort up at a tree, beautiful sunset, calling and then flying off. It doesn't get much better than that. You may have even faintly be able to hear its wings as it flew past. Wunderbar. Well done, Brian. Thank you. You have a hidden talent that I don't think you even knew you had. Um, Good, we're going to send you back to James and continue on with our adventure. See you shortly. Now, believe it or not, everyone, <laughs> well, there are two amazing things here. First is that Steph managed to spot what Viam is pointing the camera at there, and deep inside that thicket is a kill must have been made by a leopard because it's hoisted into that tree. I'm going to try and get a better view of it, but he did not see the leopard. Well, that either means that the leopard is off having a drink or perhaps it's that one that Viam spotted the other day with Scott, who we now know as Gijima, the runner. So what I'm going to do is just ease slowly backwards. It's just inside Biffle's hook. So we can't sort of get right underneath it. But if it is Gajima's kill, he will most likely be lying kind of, he'll be watching us, basically. And we need to try and spot him. Now, we can smell the kill. I wonder if that's not how Steph managed to find it. But it's, it's almost impossible to see. I can just see a glimpse of it through there. There's the leopard. The leopard is in the tree. Or oh, something else is flat. No, it must be. It is. It's in the tree. <laughs> but you can't, you're not going to be able to see it. Hang on a second. Let me get back with it. This is, this is appalling. The reason I say it's in the tree is that the limb, one of the limbs of the kill started moving. And unless the disemboweled antelope is still alive, it's being eaten. This is terrible. Can't go in there. This is just suspense of the worst kind. <laughs> I'm going to call Johan and tell him to come here. He can come here, of course. They might get a better view. I mean, even if we could get in there, people, there is a, I mean, the amount of bush in the way. Remember, you haven't seen anything, huh? Huh? I'm to kill a little bit. Did you see it moving? 
This truly is, is I'm afraid, it's almost a complete waste of time. This is as close as we can possibly get. Just try and zoom in there. That's the kill there, right? No, that's a piece of tree. Yeah. It was up there somewhere. Go for it. I saw a spot earlier there. You did see a spot? Yeah. <laughs> this is the brilliance of the leopard, of course. Say when, DMV. Oh, yeah. This is a vicious thicket of black monkey thorn trees. <laughs> it's a very nice view. And fall again? Uh, yeah. And do you think we are barking up the wrong tree, as it were? Ha ha ha. What about there? No. There's the kill. There you can see it. There. No. Uh, there. There you can see the kill. There's the kill. That is the kill. Now you can believe me, everybody. There is a, an impala lying in the tree. Did not climb up there of its own volition, and therefore we can quite safely say killed by a leopard and hauled up there. Now, as I say, I did see some movement. I'm just going to quickly update it, and just, VMP, if you wouldn't mind, just keep looking in the tree there. Johan, do you cover Johan? Johan, there is a, I think it looks like an impala in this weeping wattle tree. Best approach is to come along the Bivolso cut line. Uh, it's a big thicket, and so we can't actually, well, we can't go in there anyway, but no visual of the cat at this stage. You say you've just clocked in and what's in there? Well, uh, well, you may ask. And there's an impala sitting in the tree there. We're lying, draped in the tree, and it was definitely placed there by the spotted cat. Which spotted cat, we don't know, but I saw some brief movement just in the tree, and I was hoping that we might get a view of the leopard. It was found, this kill was found by Steph. We're just gonna do a turnaround and come past. Now, Ruth, on Twitter, you want to know how it is that I can possibly assert, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that a impala could not have climbed that tree of his own volition. Um, Ruth, I know some things are unlikely, some things are probable, and some things just, you know, seem to be completely impossible. Uh, the thought of an impala with its ho hooves being able to haul itself up into a tree and then drape itself like that, um, I think are unlikely. Likewise, I'm not sure it would have disemboweled itself at the same time. Now we're losing light here, of course. No, Deborah, you, we're not near the lions. You say, is the leopard hiding from the lions? No, we know we're near the lions. We're quite a long way from them. Now, we're going to do one very last pass by here and just see if we can't get a brief glimpse of a spot. I mean, even if we do see the leopard in there, we'd actually be able to view it. Looks like a leopard in this light. <laughs> As Viam says, I don't know if you heard him, he says, everything looks like a leopard in this light. I agree. 
It's exactly why a leopard is the colour that it is. We're going to leave it, everybody, I'm afraid. That's it. All right. We'll keep looking around here. While we do that, let's head across to Scott on Arethusa. Well, torture across there on James's vehicle, but still exciting stuff, and we thought we would give you some open, clear beauty after having your head in the bushes trying to work out what was going on with that leopard kill. Now, this may come as a bit of a surprise to a lot of you, but the sunset that we are busy enjoying will only happen again with myself here and Nikki here another four more times. You heard correctly, Nikki and I are going to be leaving Safari Live on Saturday, it will be our last day. It's obviously sad news. We love this uh, experience, this product, the team, the people, everyone here, uh, including you guys, have made our lives an absolute joy for me over a year, for Nikki uh, just approaching a year soon. And it was not an easy decision to make, but we have decided to move on. And we're not too sure where we're going to be going just yet, but we've got a few weddings around the corner uh, that we need to be at, and we're possibly going to be doing some traveling. Well, that is the main reason we're actually moving on, is just to go and explore more parts of Africa and see what else is going on on the many wonderful countries that surround us here. I've only explored a little bit of Africa so far, and my passion is seeing and discovering and exploring new places uh, and new activities, just like uh, the experience that I got to explore and experience with you guys here. It's been an incredible, incredible operation to be involved in, as you guys all know, um, maybe less so than your viewers, but I mean, it's incredible the bonds that we've all built up with one another, the moments and experiences we've all shared together, uh, considering the distances between us is, is remarkable and there's no other experience like this in the world so to leave something like this knowing that uh, you can't go and get a job elsewhere any, anywhere like this is obviously uh, you know a big decision for us but you never know what the future may hold once uh, Nikki and I have got our traveling done uh, there, anything could be possible and it's certainly not goodbye forever um, we are gonna be joining you guys, the viewers, uh, and sending through questions to keep track of everyone. Um, watching the new presenters grow is going to be something that's going to be great for, for us to experience uh, vicariously, being a viewer, and also for you guys. So that's also kind of something that I'm quite happy about, and it's made me happy by, by us leaving. We are opening up the doors for, for, for two other people to come here and, and get to have the fun and joy and love this uh, experience as much as we have. And I think there's nothing wrong with sharing that. So Coldplay, uh, I'm happy to hear that I am your favorite. Obviously, every, all of you have your favorites, and I'm obviously Coldplay's. That's very touching, so thank you. For those of you who don't know, Coldplay is a massive, very popular band, so it's quite quite touching that they, <laughs> <laughs> that they, they think I'm, I'm the best. Um, only kidding, Coldplay, but thank you very much for your kind words. Um, like I say, there's not too much really to discuss. There's no hidden agendas here. Um, it's merely time for us to move on. Of course, we're going to not be able to take you along with us on live experiences, but we certainly will keep you updated uh, on our travels, on our safaris, wherever they may be. It could be in Botswana, Zambia, Kenya. Who knows? Uh, the options are endless, and I'm really excited for the, the changes of scenery that we are going to be able to experience, and we'll definitely share those experiences with you. Again, though, not live, which is key, um, but I'll try and update my Facebook page and Instagram as often as I can. So we'll definitely be keeping Keeping you updated, but for now we don't know actually where we are going. So that in itself is 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 exciting prospects. And Nikki's shouting Kenya in my ear through the earpiece. She wants to head up there and possibly get involved in some horse riding safaris. That'll be something fun. Uh, she loves horse riding and I love safaris. So if we can do both together, then we are winning. So that might be something that we'll be able to tell you about in the future. But I'd like to say thank you now. Um, it's not the end yet. Like I said, uh, our last drive will be on, on Saturday evening. So 
four more days, four more mornings, and four more sunsets uh, will be shared with you guys. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm hoping the animals all come out of their hiding places. Um, but it seems like they have been with those lioness and the lion that James saw this evening. So things are picking up, and I hope they continue to until we head off. And after we head off, they must continue to pick up. And I want to just say thank you again for everyone. Uh, involved, including obviously the people who started Wild Earth, uh, the people who are, I've been working with, as well as you guys, the viewers who make it all possible to do what we do. So thank you very much, and apologies if it has upset you, that news, but like I say, every scenario that you may experience in life will have pros and cons, and I guess we just need to focus on the positives. Like Sharon just said, you've got to kind of follow your heart, and while Nikki and I are both young and carefree with no responsibilities, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to spread our wings and, and see where the road takes us. So that's that. And we something to look forward to, um, which has been mentioned in a blog that will be available for all of you guys to read. Uh, Facebook page that Louise kindly did regarding us going, but exciting prospects is that uh, Nikki and I will be teamed up together for the final drive on Saturday afternoon. Nikki will be on camera and I'll be driving. Uh, some of you would have seen her behind camera before and she's good. She may be a little bit shaky, I'll warn you in advance, because she hasn't done it as often as required to be super sharp. But that's going to be something to look forward to, and who knows, maybe we'll swap around and get Nikki into the driver's seat, and I'll be behind the camera so that you guys can ask her a few questions on that last drive. So that's something to look forward to, as well as the fact that we're going to be doing a fireside chat towards the end of that drive as well. So that's something to look forward to. Kada, you say you're going to be missing my number one go-to phrase when something exciting is happening and that is can you believe it <laughs> and um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a few more little catchphrases i guess but that is my go-to one that i've probably said many many times yeah what fun we've all had hey eh? really to be able to share the, the, the experiences that we have with the amount of people that we all have is fascinating. We could all one day be sitting around a ginormous campfire sharing moments and memories that we were all there witnessing as it happened. And that is something that nothing else on earth can really compete with. Usually you'd have six guests that may remember a certain thing that unfolded, but like I said, in this case, it can be hundreds, if not thousands of people, all in that moment together. And those moments that we've shared have been absolutely awesome. So thank you for jumping on our vehicles every day and making this the biggest safari operation on the planet. Andrine, you've said that we must head off and go and have fun with the hope of one day coming back. And that certainly is a hope. Um, the way the Safari Live experience is going, I can imagine only that it will grow into bigger and better things with possibly multiple operations on the go. And possibly then uh, they may need an extra hand and Nikki and I may have being traveled out by that stage and certainly I could think of nothing better than coming back in the future. I certainly will be coming to visit the crew that we've become very close to. So even if it's just socially, I will definitely be coming back here. But certainly um, if the opportunity arises, there is absolutely no reason why Nikki and I would not jump at it. But let's see what happens. It could be a long, dusty, windy road with many forks in it before the fork comes that could bring us back here, so we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> well, Susie, um, 
Thanks for letting me know that your mother has a crush on me <laughs> and that she is going to miss me. I hope you miss me as well. And I hope that your mother isn't going to miss me too terribly. That it causes you to have to console her. If that is the case, let me know if I can assist in shifts, consoling shifts. But I don't think that is going to be the case. I guess I should get the spotlights out and keep looking for animals. I'm not gone just yet. <laughs> see what we can find. On my wish list before I go, an African rock python is very, very high up there. So that's one of my wish lists. I'll continue to let you know of any others that come to mind. I just dimmed the bright lights there to spare these impalas eyeballs. Blind them. You're wondering what that little move maneuver was all about. Many, many people who have all sent through very kind words and kind wishes for our future. A huge, huge thank you. Um, it would be possible to go through all of them, and that's testament to how many people have sent those messages through. So, huge, huge thank you. And apologies that we haven't been able to address everyone's messages, but I will be certain to go through them after the safari so that I know exactly what all of you have wished and said so thank you for that and i will go through that a little bit later another thing that i'm hoping for on the wish list is that the rumors of karula still possibly having a cub is true and that we get to see her imagine we come around a corner and there she is walking with one of her cubs in her mouth down the road the other little cub battling to keep up as it's, it's turned to war. It could happen. And that is another thing that's secretly been playing in the back of my mind at the moment. Confirming whether in fact she does still have cups. It would be a very special moment to share with all of you. But so I wonder which leopard made that kill across in Buffalzook. I know James speculated that it could be Gajima, our new male leopard that we only got to see a brief glimpse of once, possibly twice, I think. Brian remembers having a sighting with him with Brent, not Brian. Maybe it was Vian. Um, and one of the cameramen I've chatted to said they remember having a brief sighting of a skittish male with Brent once upon a time, a couple of months back. Anyway, it would be good if that is him. Pity the kill isn't closer towards us, but the moments when he does have kills are going to be great moments that we can try and start habituating him. And even though in, in, in this case we won't be there, another vehicle will be there from Buffalo. And the more vehicles that he gets exposed to, eventually he will hopefully realize that we are here in peace. Let's see if we can't get you a little silhouette here. There are some kudu playing King of the Castle. Look at those huge satellite dishes poking out. And I'm sure a lot of you would have been able to tell that they was these were kudu, even though it is just their silhouette. You can't see any coloration but those massive, massive ears that can pivot in any which way they desire, one forward, one back. And what a perfect spot for those kudu to watch the sunset and listen to the surroundings, making sure they're safe. You would have noticed tiny little horns protruding on the one of the right. Oh, how was that little ear dance? That was fascinating. Um, the young male, this is a female here. A few little bugs flying around. I think those could be driver ants that are flying a lot. So I had a question about driver ants just the other day. Or it could be reproductive termites ejecting themselves from the termite mound that the kudu are standing on. That's probably more likely there's quite a few little bugs 
flying off and the numbers of them indicate, yeah, they are reproductive termites. One has just landed here that I'm going to try and show you. Yeah, I do have one in my paws. And I'm just going to let it, ooh. Okay, we're going to have to be quick. Brian's ready. Oh, it's on the end of my, oh, no, not the best, <laughs> not the best. But it's still in the car there, Brian, I think. Are we, do, are we, are we it's too close? There we go. Here it comes. It's about to pop out into view. Keep coming. Oh, here it is. I'm just going to lean under and grab it. Oh, another one's coming. Oh, here we go. Brief glimpses. They're all being attracted to the light, so they're going to flood the vehicle. But at least we know that that is the reproductive termites, the winged elates that are going to be starting new germ termitariums somewhere possibly nearby. There's also going to be a whole bunch of animals that are going to be feeding on these little flying termites as they continue to emerge in their thousands. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone, for your extremely kind words. We are going to be sending you over to James now for an update on what he's getting up to. Right, everybody, here we are. Um, well, I mean, there's not a great deal to say other than sad news, indeed. We've known for a little while, of course. Uh, but now the reality's kind of hit home. And, well, nothing stays the same, of course especially out here in the bush. There's termites everywhere, look at them. Yes, They're coming out. Hmm? They don't bite. They're termites. <laughs> and Brian, yes, I hope Scott will tell us where all the nests are before he goes. Um, that, of course, is a very minor part of why it will be sad to see him go. And of course, Nicola, let us not forget, whose dulcet tones have filled my ears since I arrived here in May last year. But anyway, as I say, the bush, I remember, you know, from working in these lodges, there's almost a constant turnover of staff as people come and go and they, you know, often people come to the bush to sort of find themselves. And sometimes they do and then they go off and sometimes they don't and they go off anyway. Um, I don't know, I don't think it's so much a case of Scott and Nikki finding themselves, but there is this constant state of flux, and it can be very unsettling, I must say. Anyway, I think it's, it's a good thing for them for now, and I hope very much that they will be back before not too long. There are millions of termites flying at my head. Ah. Right. And now you're obviously looking from Scott's vehicle and you can see these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of termites flying all over the place, attacking us. Viam, are they biting you? They just crawled under my shirt. They just crawled under Viam's shirt. I'm going to close my box here. I don't need them in my box. They're coming here, look. They're coming out right next to us, so when you come back to us, we'll show you where they're coming from. There they are. They're coming out of this mound here. Oh, my goodness. There are... <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is truly incredible. You're going to vacuum the car tomorrow. I'm going to vacuum the car. There's nothing I can do. It's summertime in the bush felt. This is what happens. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> and now apparently this shot will be amazing. He's gonna, we're going to cross back to Scott's car and you'll see these things attacking us. Are you enjoying this, or is this, is, this, is this horrible for you? No, I just don't even want to bite me. They don't bite, Viam, they're I termites. You have not been bitten by a termite before, you absolute nonsense. 
This is fantastic. Oh, they're tickling me on my leg. They're tickling me on my nose. Oh, look. <laughs> I think I'm enjoying this experience much more than Viam is. <laughs> All right, let's go back across to Scott. He'll give you his impressions. How absolutely brilliant is this? It is by far the most magical scene that I have witnessed on Safari Live, hands down. Like hundreds of little angels fluttering about James and Viem as they approached. And it's those moments and experiences that I was talking about earlier. These kinds of things we are not get, gonna get to relive with other people unless they were here now, like you. So how awesome was that? Hello. That was ridiculous. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Liam is distinctly less impressed by You're it than blind. I am. <laughs> says, they're going to bite me. <laughs> You've been bitten by a termite before? Yes. No, you haven't. Oh, I don't You're know. Right, in your dreams. Hmm? Your life. Oh, my life. You don't want more. More termites no, on No, we couldn't you. see you at all. Oh, that's all right. Still can't really see you. Oh, I'm sorry it's about tricky. that. It's tricky. Yeah, yeah, let me help. Let me help. I can help. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Too bright. No. Viem, smile. There we go. Very nice. They're nice <laughs> termites attracting them to us. Isn't that nice, Viem? <laughs> <laughs> Do you not like, enjoy the feeling of them tickling your inner thigh? <laughs> I think it's quite nice. It's a it's a better sensation than uh, that of flies. Yeah, absolutely, better than flies. So... Better than a centipede falling down your back. Yes. Yes. Exactly. All right. Well, we'll do one more lap this way, and uh, I suppose we'll okay. do lap the other way, and we'll meet back at the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Very good. It sounds good. Everyone, we're going to send you across onto James's vehicle. Come with me, everybody. Toodle do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, the termites. There we go. <laughs> Viam, why didn't you want to VR the termites? I was thinking about it. Hmm. Do you think you can VR the termites? I suppose you can. Shall we try? Uh, I'll need light. Well, here we go. I'll give you some light. Oh, the other side. OK. All right, fine. Miriam is definitely much less enthusiastic about the termites than I am. Oh, I've lost my comms again. I think I move around too much in the seat. I'm back, Nicola. I've got a stick here to beat off the termites. Here is a termite, everyone. Would you like to see the termite, Viam? Yes. There we go. And you say I mustn't think about going anywhere. And um, I'm not going anywhere. I don't really have anywhere to go, so fear not. Take those pincers. I know. They're not pincers. They are feet. It does have mouth parts, I suppose. <laughs> Look, it doesn't bite. See? That's not strictly true, actually. I think it may have just bitten me. Now, I know this has been quite fun and funny, but this is, these are the royals, of course, males and females, and they will disappear off into the ground. Hopefully they'll find a consort that isn't related, and they'll make another mound for themselves so that one day they too may have children that fly up into the air and inundate the pants and shirts of humans in the world. Right, well, that's it from us this evening. Thank you, VM, for your efforts today. Big thank you to Nikki and Louise in the final control. I'm going to hand you back to Scott on this soporific and slightly sad evening. And Brian and I will see you tomorrow at 05.30. Bye-bye. Happy that you and James managed to find the source of VM's worst nightmare, the vicious flying ant. Incorrect terminology, reproductive termite. I always make that mistake. But that is what they are kind of known as by a lot of South Africans. So 
guys, thank you again for a wonderful safari. It's been great fun having you here with us. Well done to Brian for documenting the action, as well as Nikki and the girls in final control room for all their help. We will see you all on the Sunset Safari. Who knows what is going to happen? I'm hoping there's going to be fun-filled action. We'll see you all then. Bye.